Good morning, brothers and sisters. So good to be uh, speaking to a live audience or congregation, should I say. And um, it's been lovely to sing. Phil, can I say how much I'm valuing the um, pictures behind the words when we're singing uh, our songs? It's just very uplifting. Thank you. Um, as we um, 
uh, don't have a notice sheet, could I be naughty and commend to you uh, um, a particular meeting? Um, I'd like to commend to you the, um, the Diocesan Evangelical Fellowship. I know it's a bit of a mouthful. I've been a member of it in different dioceses ever since I was ordained. It's a group of evangelical Bible-believing clergy who meet together three times a year to encourage each other and have um, really good speakers on current topics. Uh, and uh, if you'd like to be a member of that, I I'd love to tell you about that, be do her word with me. But I particularly want to mention it because on the 11th of February, Thursday the 11th in the morning, um, we'll be looking at the latest publication that the Church of England has brought out called Living in Love and Faith. You may have come across this. It's all about what we as the Church of England say we believe about marriage and sexuality. Well, if that isn't relevant currently, I don't know what is. Um, and uh, we will all, all, all churches will have to um, grapple with this. And then eventually in 18 months time or whenever, the General Synod, the Parliament of the Church of England will vote on whether as the Church of England wishes to change its official beliefs about marriage and sexuality. Um, I personally consider this very important. Um, and on the 11th of February, two of the writers of that publication, which has been written by people from different backgrounds of the Church of England, so expresses different views. Andrew and Liz Goddard, who are two of the evangelicals on the writing panel, will be coming to help us grapple with this important issue. So Thursday, the 11th of February in the morning, if you'd like to know how to register for that and details of it, uh, do please have a word with me. Advert over, let's get on to Ephesians chapter two. Last week, Peter had the great joy of helping us look at two of the great uh, prayers of the Bible in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3. And at the end of Ephesians 1, uh, Paul ends his prayer, God placed all things under his, that's Jesus, feet, and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And at the end of his prayer, Paul is saying that um, now that Jesus is seated in glory, he is now uh, filling the world with his presence. How? Through the church. Wow. I wonder if you'd take a risk like that, that God has taken. And it's a big risk, isn't it? That actually he relies on us to fill the world with his presence. And chapter two, uh, uh, Paul examines how it is that God has made that possible. Well, he started with very unpromising material. As for you, church, he says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. You can't uh, find a more difficult um, product to, to, to begin with. Dead, lifeless. Yes, we're walking around. But until we come to Christ, we are dead to the things of God. We are dead spiritually. And uh, Paul explains why. He says we are slaves of the triumvirate of evil, the world, the flesh and the devil. Uh, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. We were dedicated followers of fashion as the world seeks to squeeze us into, his mold, into its mold. Uh, and also, uh, we follow the ways of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. That's another description of the devil, the kingdom of the air, the master of what we breathe, breathe in. Uh, Eugene Peterson in her message version of this verse says, you filled your lungs with polluted unbelief and then exhaled disobedience the world the devil and then finally he says uh, we have a battle with the flesh all of us uh, lived among them at one time gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts again eugene peterson all of us did what we felt like when we felt like it uh, and so <laughs> where we seem to be powerless against this triumvirate of evil. Uh, we have the enemy within the flesh. We have the enemy around us, the world it seeks to squeeze us into its mold. And we have the enemy above us, the devil who can tear, who 
uh, seeks to control the air that we breathe. And uh, we seem to be powerless. We try hard, but we don't seem to be able to resist. I don't know whether you uh, have made any New Year's, New Year's resolutions this year. Maybe not. I don't know. It may not be a year for that, but maybe you have. Uh, well, on the 24th of January, if you have, I wonder how many of them are still in action, still going strong. Um, I'm afraid that when I make such things, they don't last till the 24th of January. And many of us find that we're unable to resist the temptation of one form or another. And the result? Well, to go back to Eugene Peterson again, this is how he translates it. It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with the whole lot of us, because that is what we deserved. Well, that's pretty bleak stuff, isn't it? However, there then follow two of the most wonderful words in the Bible. They are um, repeated many times, and they're absolutely crucial. And they're these two words, but God. We were dead, lifeless, but God. We were powerless to resist, but God. We were slaves to the triumvirate of evil, but God. There is always a but God. And what did God do? Well, Paul says in verse five that he made us alive with Christ. He raised us up with Christ. And he has seated us with Christ in the heavenly realms. So he's saying, you see, if we've entrusted ourselves to Jesus Christ, we share in his resurrection, his ascension and his exaltation. Well, you may ask, well, where are we now then? Well, we are seated. You and I, brothers and sisters, are seated with Jesus Christ, seated beside the throne. We who were lifeless, powerless slaves are seated with Jesus Christ in glory. And this is not just a piece of meaningless mysticism. It bears witness to a living experience that Jesus Christ has given us a new life with, with a sensitive awareness of the presence and the reality of God, a love for him and a love for his people. Let me ask you, do you love God? Well, a little bit, maybe. I'm sure like me, you'd like to love him more. Do you love his people? Yeah, well, some of them, maybe. Well, if you do, that's because you have his life coursing through your veins. But not just his life, he has made us alive with Christ, but a new power. Will you follow Paul's argument here? At the end of chapter one, he says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father and all things are put under his feet for the church. And then in verse six of our chapter, he says, we are seated with him. So Jesus is seated in glory. Everything is under his feet. We are seated with him. So where is every, where are everything, all those things, the world, the flesh of the devil, as far as we're concerned? Well, uh, in Christ, they are under our feet. That's worth a hallelujah. You see, brothers and sisters, it means that we're not powerless that the New Year's resolutions are not impossible, that we don't have to fail. We will fail from time to time, of course, because we are a work in progress. But change is afoot. Well, you may say, why on earth did God do all this? I'd like to finish with four words that Paul expresses to show why God did it. Mercy, love, grace and kindness. God who is rich in mercy. You know, mercy is what a person who is in a position of power can exercise towards someone who isn't. The story is told of a, an elderly widow who came to the Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte to plead on behalf of her son, who was, um, had been, he was in the ranks, and he'd been uh, condemned to execution because he'd gone AWOL. No, said uh, the, the, um, Napoleon, I can't do anything about it. He doesn't deserve to be pardoned. And to which the woman cried, sir, I'm not asking for justice. I'm asking for mercy. 
Ah, well, said Napoleon, if it's mercy you're after, it's mercy you shall have. And the boy was released. God shows, the one in power has shows mercy to us who are powerless. Mercy, love, grace. Grace is love that we don't deserve. Love that we can't earn, love that we can't produce ourselves, but love that must be paid for. I've no doubt that um, many of your family and friends have enjoyed receiving presents from you over Christmas. It's lovely to have gifts, isn't it? Um, but uh, you will also, uh, no doubt, received in the last few days the credit card bill, the January bill is always rather high, isn't it? They've enjoyed receiving your gifts, but you've had to pay for it. Jesus has given us a new life, but it's all of grace. It's love we don't deserve, and it's love that he has paid for with his life. Mercy, love, grace, and kindness are the four words that Paul uses. My dear late wife, often used to like to, re <coughs> to remind me of a verse in the book of Proverbs, the charm of a man is his kindness. I wasn't quite sure whether that was meant to be an encouragement uh, or a challenge, but anyway. And why did God do all this? Because that is who God is. He is a God of mercy, love, grace, and kindness. But he didn't finish there. One of the reasons he did all this for us is not just for us, he did it for the world. Uh, so that as we uh, end where we began, he might reflect his fullness through you and me, through the church. And he does that by showing that um, he's remade us, we're his workmanship. And because he's already planned that he has things for us to do, people to see uh, that will reflect his mercy and love and grace and kindness. And he's already planned it ahead of time for you and for me. Um, let me finish the story. I had a, a lovely email last week from a very dear friend <coughs> who's just begun on the 4th of January, a new job as a hospice chaplain for the first time. And as I'd been a hospice chaplain for 13 years in my working life, um, we talked a lot about it and I've been praying for her and, and um, longing to know how the first week went. And in her email, she says, on the first day, she walked into the ward and there in front of her in one of the beds, one of the patients, she noticed her, um, her daughter's former dance teacher. The two of them hadn't seen each other for years uh, when they used to live 300 miles away. And now here was uh, this old friend uh, lying in the bed in front of her. And this patient, a non-practicing Catholic, had said to God the night before, God, what can you do for me? And the following morning, my friend walked into the ward. It was a divine appointment, something that God had prepared beforehand. God has divine appointments for you and for me. He has things for you and me to say and do, already prepared uh, at, 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 at any time. And as we do them, he will reflect his mercy and love and grace and kindness to the world. In this desperate time, many in their own hearts are asking, where can we get help? Surely there must be more to life than this. And as his church, you and me, my brothers and sisters, show his mercy and love and grace and kindness in walking into those things that he has for us to do and he's prepared beforehand so others will come to see what he's really like and God willing will turn to him. Amen.
Jesus.